Okay, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dan Riley. I'm with the National Weather Service, the Houston Galveston office. Been with the Weather Service 29 years. And I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about hurricane preparedness and the 2022 hurricane season. Pictured here, we have a satellite image of Hurricane Ida from last year, 2021. This storm uh, made landfall around New Orleans uh, and then continued on inland and produced a lot of flooding uh, up along New Jersey, New York City area. So when is the hurricane season? Uh, first of all, well, we all think of it as nominally between June 1st and November 30th. Uh, but in recent years, we've had a lot of storms before June 1st. Not in 2022, but the previous six years actually had a May storm. So in reality, the season starts probably a little bit earlier than June 1st. And what you can see on this uh, chart here is basically a, uh, an activity map during the hurricane season. So if you look at the lower axis here, we've got May 1st through the end of December. And the way this chart is formed is you basically go to each calendar day in that time range, in that date range, and count up the number of storms that were out there dating back to 1944. And so what you see is June and July are usually pretty quiet. Maybe a storm or two like we've had this year. It's not unusual to have not a lot of activity in June and July. But once we get to August, things typically start to ramp up. And I'll go ahead and put where we are in this map uh, with this arrow here at the start of August. So typically about now, we start to see more storms form. Uh, and right now it's still quiet, so that's a good thing. Uh, but as we go into August and certainly September where we peak, we would accept, expect to see many more storms forming out over the Atlantic. Now, once we get after about September 13th, we're on the back side of that peak. Uh, and then we the activity slowly declines as we go through October. Here in Texas, if we can get to October, we're usually in pretty good shape because the late season storms that do form are more likely to be nudged off to the east. How often do we get hurricanes along the uh, coastline? Uh, that's what these maps are showing. Uh, if you look at these numbers on the lower left, this is the return period for a close approach from a hurricane, say within about 50 miles. So if you see the number nine here down near Galveston, what that means is on average, a hurricane tracks within 50 miles of Galveston about one every nine years or it has about a one in nine chance any given year of occurring. And then on the lower right, you see the number 25 there near Galveston. That means we've got about a one in 25 chance any given year of getting a close approach from a major hurricane, which is category three or greater. Here's a look at the uh, hurricane names that are set out uh, for the next five years. Actually, the next six years, the names are already uh, set out or, or defined. And what happens is if a storm doesn't have a huge impact, the name gets reused on the seventh year. So you see our 2022 list, that'll actually be reused in 2028, unless any of the storms on this list have a big impact. Now, thinking back last year, there was one storm that was retired. Uh, if the storm has a big impact, the name is retired. Uh, and that was Hurricane Ida from last year. And we've actually had three storms that have been named already. We've had Alex, Bonnie, and Colin. None of these storms had much of an impact at all, really uh, quite benign. Uh, Colin being the most recent, uh, which dissipated, <coughs> excuse me, on July 2nd. So you can see we've gone a full month since Colin with really no activity. And that's unusual not to have no name storms uh, over the past month. Again, usually not many, but usually uh, we will get one or two uh, during the month of July. Now, one thing I want you to know is a lot of our storms that impact Texas actually form in the Gulf of Mexico. 
not every storm uh, forms way out over the Atlantic. You know, thinking back to Rita, Katrina, and Ike, those were hurricanes that tracked, you know, for thousands of miles, and we could watch them for almost two weeks uh, head our direction. But most storms form in the Gulf itself, and those we don't have much time to prepare. So the key point I'm making here is now is the time to get your preparations in order uh, when there's nothing out there. Uh, uh, if you wait till the storm does start to form, you probably won't have much time, and then everyone is rushing to gather supplies. So uh, really now is the time to make those preparations. And what this map is showing is all the hurricanes and tropical storms to impact Texas since 2010. All nine of those uh, either developed or redeveloped in the Gulf of Mexico. You see this one longer track, this is Harvey. If you remember back to Harvey, it actually dissipated in the Caribbean and then reformed in the Gulf. So it's more common for our storms to actually form sort of on our doorstep uh, and then come in within two or three days. Every storm is different, hurricane, tropical storm, some combination of these hazards, damaging winds, storm surge flooding, flooding rains, tornadoes, and high surf and rip currents. Every storm, again, some combination of these. Uh, some of you all may remember Hurricane Ike in 2008. Ike was all about storm surge and high winds and a lot of power outages from Hurricane Ike. Uh, a lot of trees were knocked down in the wooded areas, but the storm surge flooding uh, near the coast was really catastrophic, uh, very life-threatening. Harvey in 2017 was nothing like Ike. The storm surge wasn't that uh, severe. The winds weren't that strong, but what, what we did have is torrential rainfall and flooding. So just looking, comparing Harvey and Ike, you can see how different these storms can be. And then there's some other storms mentioned here, Hurricane Alicia, Alicia back in 1983, that was a category three storm uh, that made landfall in Galveston. Uh, and then Harvey had a lot of tornadoes as well, in addition to the, the, the flooding rains. And then many of these storms have high surf uh, at the Gulf Coast. Looking back at our hurricane history, uh, what I'm plotting here is all the category three or greater hurricanes since 1900 to track within 60 miles of Galveston. All right, so that's what we've plotted here. This website is great. You can define your search any way you like. And so that's how I've defined this one. And look at these tracks. Now these purple lines, these are category four. These are very intense hurricanes. And you know, we all uh, know about the 1900 Galveston storm. That was our nation's greatest natural disaster in terms of loss of life, even to this day. Between 6,000 and 8,000 lives were lost from the 1900 storm, mostly in Galveston. Um, now, after the 1900 storm, folks in Galveston amazingly raised the island, in some cases greater than 10 feet on the seawall side, uh, and um, from what it was. So, you know, the, your elevation of the Galveston Island now near the seawall is about 17 feet. Back then it was two or three feet uh, with about five feet up on Broadway. So the island was raised and the seawall was built. And that was just in time because there was actually a 1909 storm that tracked not too far away, uh, you know, sort of on the heels of that 1900 hurricane. And then the 1915 track was another category four, right, very, making landfall very similar to the 1900 storm. And the impacts were not nearly as high uh, because one, people remember the 1900 storm and, and, and got away, and two, the seawall uh, protected Galveston. So, uh, but the point here is, look at this, we had three category four uh, hurricanes in the early part of the 1900s. And we haven't really had a storm like that since. Uh, Alicia was the category three, which was pretty close, uh, tracking interestingly on that west end of Galveston. Point I'm making is we can get these really high category storms and, and a, a track like that today uh, would ha have a tremendous impact, not only on Galveston, 
but all of the greater Houston area or wherever it does make landfall. And of course, we, uh, we had Laura just a few years ago that was pretty close to us, right? It, it tracked uh, more into the Lake Charles area and uh, southwest Louisiana. Uh, but that was a close call for us, uh, as was Rita uh, back in 2005. If you remember Rita, Rita was heading right toward us, uh, but then it turned at the end uh, and did not make a direct hit. So we certainly have a lot of storms in our history. Last year, we did have a storm. It was Hercules, um, but by the time it impacted our area, it was very much a tropical storm. And what I'm showing you here is a radar loop of Nicholas. You see kind of a comma shape there on the radar, kind of a swirling there uh, as it makes landfall down the coast near Sargent, Texas. And then you see the swirl in the satellite as well. What kinds of winds did we see with Nicholas uh, locally? Well, uh, Galveston Airport had a wind gust of 58 miles per hour. You can see down near Surfside in San Luis Pass. Uh, the wind gust was closer to 66, and no doubt on the seawall, we were getting wind gusts up over 60 miles per hour as well. So uh, the winds were tropical storm force. They were not hurricane force, uh, but they were enough to cause some issues. Uh, a lot of people lost power, for example, from Nicholas, uh, with 515,000 homes losing power. So uh, that was probably our biggest wind type of storm since Ike back in 2008 when we had full-fledged hurricane force winds. Now, of those five hazards I mentioned, uh, which are the most dangerous? And when I'm plotting here uh, on the pie chart, it's showing the percentage of fatalities from these different hazards. So what you see very clearly is half the fatalities from hurricanes and tropical storms are from the storm surge flooding, just like the Galveston 1900 storm, that was all storm surge related. Uh, and Katrina as well, uh, related to storm surge plus a uh, levee failure there. And then flooding rains is right behind over 25%. So it's the water related hazards that caused greater than 90% of the fatalities. What does this mean for you? It means if you're in a storm surge zone and there's a storm surge type storm coming like an Ike or a 1900 storm or a Carla, you're really gonna wanna evacuate and get out of the way of the storm and then just come back after. Uh, you know, Maybe the storm doesn't have a huge impact and you just come back and, and, and resume the way things were, but you don't wanna ride out a storm surge type hurricane in a surge zone. And then there's a lot of indirect hazards uh, that we don't always think about. Uh, things like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, also the loss of power. You may lose medical equipment, critical medical equipment. Uh, so you have to think of this ahead of time. Uh, there's also typically a, a jump in uh, heart attacks because of all the stress and strain before, during, and after the storm. And then there's an increase in motor vehicle accidents. And, you have to be wary of down power lines, uh, even things like snakes and things of that nature that get stirred up. So there's a lot of hazards uh, after the hurricane that are sort of indirect that we don't always think about, um, but they, they can be a big concern. And, and as I said, medical equipment outage is one. Um, uh, you can see the list there. And we saw this with the freeze as well, of course, when, when there was such a large loss of power and heat um, it was kind of those indirect effects that were the most uh, dangerous as it turned out, along with the, the uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. What happens is people run their generators, uh, but they need to run those outside in a well-ventilated area. You can't run those in a garage or certainly not inside, uh, and so keep that in mind. So let's look back at Hurricane Ike in 2008. Uh, some of you there out there may uh, remember this hurricane. Uh, this is a radar image uh, with the eye of the hurricane situated right over Galveston Bay uh, at this point. And so that's what, I'm, uh, what you see in the middle there, that blue area in the middle of this swirling hurricane. Now, I want to point out a, a couple parts of the hurricane to keep in mind. You see this uh, donut uh, shape around the eye. That's called the eye wall. 
Uh, that's where the highest winds are in the hurricane. So if the eye wall passes over your location, you're gonna get those high winds that the storm uh, is producing. If you miss the eye wall, uh, the winds won't be nearly as high. Uh, so if you consider uh, Hurricane Ike with the eye over Galveston Bay, you can see Southeast Harris, Galveston County, uh, even Eastern Brazoria County, and certainly Chambers and Liberty on toward Jefferson County. They were all in that eye wall zone. And so they were all getting the hurricane force winds. Whereas if you get out to Wharton, Matagorda, Western Fort Bend County, the winds were not nearly as strong. So, you know, we rate the hurricane, uh, Cat 1 through Cat 5, uh, based on the winds. And, um, and not everyone understands that. It's just a wind scale. It's not an overall severity scale. So I think back to Hurricane Ike. There were people in Galveston saying, um, you know, I'm not going to leave. It's just a Category 2. It's a Cat 2. Um, but we understood that, first of all, Category 2 means sustained winds of 96 to 110 miles per hour. That's very, very dangerous uh, as far as the winds go. But it doesn't tell you about the storm surge or the flooding rain threat uh, or the tornadoes. So you have to take into account more than just that one number. And we were telling our emergency managers, Ike is a large two, but it's going to produce a surge more like a four with 10 to 15 feet of water uh, rushing out over Bolivar. And so we really wanted to make sure people understood that. Now, I mentioned every hurricane and every storm is different. Sometimes the same storm is different depending on where you're at. Uh, for areas down the coast with Harvey back in uh, 2017, uh, you can see uh, for them, they got the eye wall of a category four hurricane in 2017. Um, and so they had wind gusts over 130, 140 miles per hour. Uh, you know, that's where the wind part of the hurricane was and the storm surge. Um, so for them, you can see some of the wind damage here in the Rockport area. For us, we did not get the eye wall part of Harvey. So we did not get the wind part of the hurricane. The winds were really not that severe. But what we did get are the spiral bands on the right-hand side of the hurricane. Uh, let me go back to Hurricane Ike here. You see these areas in red that I've drawn in. These are what we refer to as spiral bands. And especially those bands on the right-hand side of the track, they can produce very heavy rain and tornadoes. And sure enough, with Harvey, that's what we got. We got very heavy rains and tornadoes from the spiral bands on the right-hand side of the track. And with Harvey, we got rains like no other storm. Uh, this was... Uh, a record rainfall producer at the time um, with over 60 inches of rain, potentially. That's five feet of rain in uh, near Nederland, Texas. Uh, now, since then, there was actually a, a, a tropical cyclone in Hawaii that may have had more rain than this. Uh, but this record here still holds for the continental U.S. And after Harvey, you know, a lot of people said, oh, that's a once in a lifetime storm. It'll never happen again. Well, two years later, we had Imelda. Uh, Imelda produced over 40 inches of rain in Jefferson County, over 40. In fact, some parts of that area flooded that did not flood for Hurricane Harvey. So when it rains here in Southeast Texas and over into Louisiana, it can rain a tremendous amount. Uh, we can get feet of rain, as we know. Uh, and when that happens, you're going to get flooding from just from the heavy rain alone. What I'm showing here are actually rainfall amounts using the same color scale for Harvey in 2017, Imelda in 2019, Claudette in 1979, and Allison in 2001. These were all slow moving storms. That's very important. Anytime you have a slow moving tropical storm or hurricane, you, you need to think about flooding rains. And all of these produced feet of rain. Uh, Harvey, the, 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 the footprint, the large area that it encompassed was also uh, remarkable. Um, but 
Um, the the, the uh, Claudette in 1979, also a U.S. record for 24-hour rainfall, 43 inches in, tw in 24 hours in Alvin, Texas. Here's a look now at Hurricane Ike. You can see it swirling here over the Gulf, uh, making landfall uh, on the east end of Galveston and then tracking over Galveston Bay. We're in the eye wall here in the Galveston, Houston Galveston area. So we're getting those high winds that I talked about with Ike uh, that we didn't get with Harvey. Plus a large hurricane has the ability to push a lot of water onto land. And Ike certainly did with a tremendously dangerous, significant storm surge uh, sweeping over uh, some of our coastal areas. And you can see a satellite view of Ike. It's got a, a kind of a ragged eye uh, and just a huge storm covering almost the entire Gulf of Mexico. Talking about the uh, storm surge flooding and high surf a little bit more. A couple interesting photographs here. I mentioned the seawall being built after the 1900 storm. Uh, look at this photo uh, from Rosenberg Library uh, of the seawall from the 1915 hurricane absorbing the surf crashing into the seawall. And then look at this, a very similar photo uh, with Hurricane Ike in uh, 2008. So seawall uh, really doing its job for over 100 years now, protecting Galveston Island. And those waves can be very destructive and very uh, powerful. They can uh, start to hit the coastline a day or two before the winds arrive. Uh, the other thing is the water uh, starts to rise uh, 24 to 36 hours as well before the winds rise. So if you look at the photograph here on the right, kind of an important lesson here, that is if you need to evacuate, evacuate early. Uh, these folks uh, waited till Friday morning with the storm's winds coming in Friday night, thinking they were going to be, leave, fr be able to leave Friday morning. Uh, but look what's happened. The water has already risen too much and the water is, the, the roadways, excuse me, are flooded. So they can't get out except by rescue, uh, by boat or even helicopter in some cases. Uh, and there were hundreds of people actually airlifted off Bolivar Peninsula the day prior to the hurricane because they couldn't get off by, by car. And you can see how important that was, that the Coast Guard uh, was able to airlift off over 300 people off Bolivar. Uh, look at the land area here after Hurricane Ike for Bolivar Peninsula, uh, just swept clear of houses uh, that were there. There is one house still standing, uh, kind of amazingly there. Uh, but this is just, you can understand, no place that you want to be to ride out a storm. Uh, you've got greater than 10 feet of water sweeping over that land mass, just taking all the homes away, wiping them down to the slab, and you just can't survive that type of situation. So if we do get a surge type storm, the Weather Service is really going to be uh, pushing this information, and your elected officials are going to really ask, order an evacuation most likely, uh, because you just, you just don't, you just can't survive. Uh, the power of water when it's this severe. Now, the storm surge in the lower left, it, it illustrates how it tends to be worse near and to the right of the center track. Um, I mentioned earlier that the spiral bands uh, produce tornadoes mainly to the right of the center track as well. Turns out all the hazards are a bit worse near and to the right of where the center tracks. So uh, that's where the, the term, the dirty side of the storm comes from. Uh, that, you, you know, if you have that direct hit or you're on the right-hand side of the track, you can expect some pretty serious impacts. Let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about uh, preparedness. Um, the first step uh, in, in getting prepared for hurricanes is understanding your risk. Think about where you live, uh, where you work. Uh, you know, what is your risk of storm surge? Are you in a storm surge zone? Are you in an evacuation zone? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, what about winds? What kind of winds can your home withstand? You know, if you're in a mobile home, you know, you, you, it could be tropical storm force winds may cause you an issue. Uh, you know, or maybe your home is built to code. So maybe it's more uh, 
rated for category one. So understand uh, what your risks are. Are you in a flood zone for heavy rain? You know, are you in that 100 year flood zone or 500 year? Uh, if you are at risk, you're going to want to have an evacuation plan. And that's the next slide here is develop that evacuation plan. Uh, have an idea uh, what route you would take. Uh, and the key is to get inland first. Uh, and then I always try to get left of the track as well. Do you have family or friends you can stay with that are uh, outside the surge zone inland? Um, or do you want to uh, sort of map out where you might stay at a hotel? Um, uh, are you are you taking a pet with you? You know, you you want some accommodation that they'll uh, they'll take pets. Uh, plan several routes too. You know, don't don't just count on one. If there's an accident or some other slowdown, you might want to have a plan B. And have a go bag. You know, we're going to talk about supply kits in a minute, but that also applies if you're evacuating. You want to, in that case, be able to take, essentially take that supply kit with you. Now, uh, this region does use zip codes for evacuation routes. So take a look at this map and you can look at this online too. Uh, basically, Houston zip zone evacuation map. You search that term or Houston evacuation zones hurricane evacuation zones, you'll see this map. And you can kind of see where your zip code fits into this. On this map, the purple areas are considered coastal counties and they're the first ones to evacuate. They're the most at risk from storm surge. So folks on Bolivar and Galveston, their evacuation orders ideally will be issued first so they, they can get out. And then if the storm is bad enough, it, the next in line would be these yellow zones. Um, and then, uh, you know, for a higher category storm, it's possible some of these green zip codes would be ordered. It would be very rare for the orange uh, areas to have an evacuation ordered, but it could happen for, um, say, a Cat 4 or Cat 5. And then all the areas without shading, uh, you know, take heart. You're probably not going to have a mandatory evacuation for your area, uh, but you can still choose to evacuate if, you, if, you're, if you're uncomfortable. For example, if you have a lot of trees, uh, large trees near your home, or you're in a mobile home and you don't feel safe with the winds that are forecast, uh, you can still choose to evacuate even if you're not in an evacuation zone. Assembled disaster supplies, uh, you know, we're talking about food and water, of course, um, keep that gas tank uh, as best you can, uh, greater than half full during the hurricane season, having extra cash on hand, uh, having an adequate supply of medicine. Uh, these are all things to consider. Uh, and then having a radio uh, with batteries, uh, having that phone charger with you uh, in the car. Uh, these are all things to consider. Get an insurance checkup. One thing I like to highlight here is Consider flood insurance. For those of y'all that live through Harvey, uh, you know that with insurance, you're gonna, it's gonna be easier to, to get back to normal, uh, to recover from a storm like Harvey. Uh, you'll get more financial assistance to rebuild than you will without flood insurance. So uh, the National Flood Insurance Program is subsidized by the government. And you know, I would advise advise any of you, if you can, to get flood insurance because of all the rain we can get. Uh, check with your agent in general for your uh, homeowner's policy. Remember, that won't cover uh, flood damage. You may not know that. Your homeowner's policy generally won't, so you need this extra uh, flood insurance. Keep your documents with you in a, uh, a water's, uh, water's tight uh, container or bag. Strengthen your home. There's things you can do now. Cover ahead of a storm. Cover your windows. Secure loose outdoor items. You know, with high winds, those things can get blown around and, and hit your house and, and act as a projectile. Uh, it's a good idea to trim those trees. You know, if they get really overgrown, those branches can come down. And, and then move that vehicle to a safe location. If you are riding out the storm, see if you can put that in a garage or some other uh, shelter. So uh, that's just a little bit about um, preparedness. Uh, what about the situation in the tropics now? 
Uh, one thing you can do is keep an eye on this. This is called a graphical tropical weather outlook. You find it on hurricanes.gov. That's the National Hurricane Center's website. Check it every day during the hurricane season. And what we see here is there's really nothing much out over the Atlantic. We do have a cluster of storms uh, off Louisiana that's not expected to develop into anything. Uh, in the tropics, uh, there's really not a whole lot going on except down near the equator. Uh, so nothing expected in the next two days. There's a five-day outlook too, and nothing expected over the next five days. So, you know, so far uh, it's been a fairly quiet period and that's expected to continue really at least for the next week or more. What is the forecast uh, for the hurricane season? Well, uh, NOAA is forecasting above average activity despite how quiet it's been lately. Uh, we think once we get into August and September, we're going to see many more storms. So forecast is for 14 to 21 named storms. That includes hurricanes and tropical storms, 6 to 10 hurricanes, and 3 to 6 major hurricanes, uh, Cat 3 or greater. Where will they go? We don't know. We have no way to predict whether they will curl back out to sea or whether they, whether they uh, make landfall uh, across the U.S. or anywhere else, whether it be Texas or or anywhere, so we don't have a way to predict that. Uh, I did want to say there is an update to this forecast. This forecast came out in May. Uh, there'll be an update to the NOAA forecast later this week, so look for that. And uh, I just want to finish up here uh, with our social media. Uh, you know, we want you all to be informed. We want you to follow our website, our social media, NWS Houston. Uh, you can also follow the National Hurricane Center and, and all the information that they put out. Uh, we also have an electronic guide that has a lot more preparedness information in it. Uh, any of you all can uh, scan this QR code on your phone and get it onto your mobile device or your tablet. Or you can just go to our website and look at it on your computer. So we encourage you to take a look at this. It's, uh, it's a good 50 pages of uh, really good information on things you might not have considered kind of in more detail than we talked about this afternoon. So uh, that's all the information I have. Thank you for uh, for listening.